Good morning. I've been instructed to go slower between things because uh, Tom isn't here and Stuart is hitting all the buttons, so I can't, I can't move as quick because he's got to do double duty. Um, Welcome to worship today. Uh, today is Christ the King Sunday. It is the last year in the liturgical calendar, which feels weird because in the I, just regular calendar, does it have a special name? Greco-Roman calendar? I don't know. In the regular calendar, we've got a month left. But in terms of our, our uh, liturgical calendar, this is the end, and it ends with uh, us proclaiming Christ is King. Uh, and so that'll be our theme throughout worship today. Uh, and you'll notice uh, we've had the same bulletin cover for the last several weeks, but this week it's different. <laughs> We changed it up, kind of, and, and took the same theme and made little Jesus standing on the earth. It's kind of cute, right? I thought it was adorable. Um, but so, um, but uh, with that, uh, that'll be our theme today. Uh, we got, I got some surprises in store, and we'll kind of end our whole series on it's the end of the world as we know it, reflecting on what that means in, in the reality that Christ is still king. Um, I see... I, d I didn't know, but I see a couple of OU shirts. So did OU win? <laughs> I just, I haven't seen people proud recently, so I just didn't know. <laughs> and Nebraska won too? Yeah. So who, el who else do we have typically that OSU? Yeah, there's no orange here today. What about Texas? Yeah, we, oh, yeah, we won. We're Texas. Uh, <laughs> and, and you know who else won? The Packers beat the Bears on a walk-off field goal block, and it was absolutely epic. So uh, now that we got all that out of our systems, let's actually focus on why we're here, which is not sports, but Jesus. Uh, so let's prepare our hearts and our minds and our souls to worship God by standing and joining together in our call to worship. Come, let us celebrate the goodness of God. God has blessed us with God's great love. Let us come to this time letting go of our worries. Let us come to this time praising God. Come, now is the time to worship. We come rejoicing, for God is so good to us. And now let's join in singing hymn number 88, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. <clears throat>
going to talk about. No, not football. Although I do love football. Jen. I do love football. What do you guys think? Oh, thank you. Yeah, be, yeah Thanksgiving, right? Kind of makes sense because that is this week, right? And being thankful, right? Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Um, I love a former teacher back there, right? Wouldn't know that the themes, right? We we concentrate on the, we tend to concentrate on themes as teachers, but but anyway, um, what do we have that we can give thanks for? Well, let me let me tell you a little story real quick because I think it's a good story. Um, you guys help this this wonderful church help support um, actually two families that I had last year, if you remember, that were um, that are Spanish speaking families. Uh, that came over legally into our country, uh, but we're having a really rough struggle. And if you remember last year, I asked for donations. You guys really stepped up. We got so many things for them. Um, not only things, but we also had monetary donations as well. And it really blessed them. And so yesterday, I saw one of those families again. Actually, it, ha- it so happens that the two girls that I had that we helped the family with the mom, uh, they went back to public school because they wanted to learn the language better and be around it, you know, every day, which I understood. Um, But the other family that I had, um, they also left. (laughs) Unfortunately, they left Epic, but um, the same kind of thing. They they needed to work and they needed their daughters, both daughters to go to school. Um, However, I still stay in touch with them. And so um, it's really cool because they they, uh, texted me the other day. And a lot of times the texting doesn't quite makes sense because you know he's using google translate because he doesn't speak they don't speak any english so they google translate the text that they send me and sometimes it's really funny what it says like for instance yesterday it was mr marty and i thought okay i know he doesn't think i'm a mister surely not um and then one day he said he kept saying vote 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 and i thought what's he talking about vote he was talking about getting rid of some old furniture and he kept going vote and that basically that means vote in Spanish means like clearing stuff out, like getting rid of stuff. And he kept going vote, and I said he's going to go vote for the president. So I, so anyway, so I told him that yesterday, and he just laughed and laughed. I thought that was so funny. But anyway, but the the moral of my story is yesterday we went to go help them move. They moved to an apartment, and um, there's five of them, and they moved to a two bedroom apartment. So we still need to keep them in our prayers. That's going to be you know kind of tight. Um, however, we helped him move all day yesterday and, you know, I, I, um, was talking to him and his wife and everything we do, we have to do through our phone because Google, again, Google translate, I have to say it in English and then I play it back to him in Spanish. So it's a little bit of, of trouble, but it's, 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 it's a fun way to do it. It, it. I'm glad we have this. I mean, I wouldn't be able to communicate otherwise with them. And so I said, you know, I'm really impressed with how you guys have fought to come over and how you've done it legally and how... You have had just so many things going on in your life, but you've kept going and you've kept uh, persevering. And I, I just, I'm, you know, I'm really impressed and and have a lot of um, great pride in what you've done. And I just feel like that, you know, it's an honor to know you guys. And he said, he said, well, you know what? He said, the good Lord has blessed us. So immediately he went to God has blessed us. God, we feel like God wanted us to be here. And he has blessed us with this opportunity, and we couldn't be more grateful. And I thought, you know what? Through all the stuff that they've been through, through all this heartache, for, through living in a two-bedroom apartment with five people um, in it, they are truly thankful. And they are thankful to God because God has blessed them with this wonderful opportunity. So, you know, as we go about this Thanksgiving season, um, things sometimes are difficult. Sometimes families come in and um, they don't like Texas football or, or you know, or they, they might have OU family. Who knows? But, you know, <laughs> they come in and, and sometimes you might argue or sometimes it may not be the best situation or you may have a family that's estranged from you. But even in those times, I think we can remember what God has given us in this country and what he, uh, the joys and the um, gifts and the grace that he gives us every day. And we can be thankful for that, can't we? I think so. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the gifts that you give us here. Thank you, Lord, for um, families that recognize those gifts and help us to uh, just be thankful for all that we have.
In your precious name that we pray, amen. Again, we, you know, I think gratitude is, is an important thing to remember, um, and it's also a way of uh, kind of humbling ourselves. If you're grateful for what people have done, you have to acknowledge in some ways your inability to achieve at times. Um, and as we come to today and we think about those things and we remember that, you know, this, this idea that Christ is king, that Jesus is not just our savior, but the reigning king of all creation, uh, it's, we are here by God's grace, um, it also calls us to reflect on the reality that if we're honest, we don't often live as though Christ's kingdom rules and reigns in our hearts and our lives. We give in to temptation, we rely on our own strength, we ignore Christ's calling to love and serve others in this world. Um, and so we kind of make ourselves kings and queens, if you will. But the good news for us is that Christ will always welcome us and always invite us to come as we are, to bring our brokenness and our failures before him so that we can be made anew over and over and over again. And so trusting in that, trusting in God's grace, trusting in the love that God has for us, let's turn to God in our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Almighty God, we are intoxicated by power, the power to dominate, the power to control, the power to punish, the power to reward, the power to have our own way. We live in a powerful country with powerful leaders and a powerful military. Forgive us when we lose sight of what true power is all about. Forgive us when we forget that Jesus is our true and only King. Help us refasten our gaze on Christ's kingdom, that we might work to bring this kingdom here on earth. In the name of the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, we pray. Amen. Friends, hear the good news today. Jesus, our King, is full of grace and truth. And so in the name of Jesus, I declare that we are forgiven. And so go live now as a child of the King, free to love and serve him in all things and in all ways. And let's do that first. Sorry, skipping ahead. Let's respond and sing, and then we'll do that by sharing things. But let's stand and, and sing God's praise. No, so I, I, will, I will confess, that came about because uh, one of the things that I have been told a lot recently is, I've been a musician most of my life, and I'm not doing anything musical anymore, um, and that's not good for my soul, uh, and so I needed to do something. And so I thought, could I, could I just change all of the words and make this work? <laughs> And so Emerson and I got in the car the other day, and she was just singing, well, Dad, you could sing the chorus like this, and, and she got hooked, and so we spent all of last Sunday writing a brand new version, and it was so much fun. Um, and so I thought, yep, this, this has to happen, uh, because we are in this series, it's the end of the world as we know it, um, and this is still part of that, but today it is the reign of Christ, and so uh, that changes things a little bit. Um, just kind of to set up our text today, you know, over the last several weeks, we have been talking about how we cling to our faith in difficult times. Uh, we've been looking at texts that are, are dark texts, dark moments of our, of our collective faith experiences, and we've been asking how we can remain hope-filled even when all the headlines try to conspire to steal our hopes and our joys. And so today kind of fittingly, our text is going to invite us to reflect on what is simultaneously the, the darkest moment in our Christian experience, in our Christian story, as well as the greatest source of hope 
and the greatest example of what living into God's kingdom looks like. And so with that, if you want to follow along in your Bibles, you can. We'll be reading from the uh, 23rd chapter of the Gospel of Luke, starting in verse 33 through 43. So hear now the word of the Lord. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching. But the, the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy God, we give you all thanks and praise uh, for this moment, for this ability to come to study your word, to think about the ways it touches our hearts and our minds and our lives, that it speaks into our world and our experiences. And we ask that in this moment that your spirit speak through it to us, that we would have ears to hear and hearts to discern what it is you are saying to each of us in this moment, and that we will be obedient to those words, that we will allow you to change us and transform us and make us more and more into the image of Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, again, uh, if you read the Monday email or you've been listening at any point in this service, you know today is Christ the King Sunday. It's a special moment in our, our you know, liturgical calendar. And, and because it's talking about the kingship of Christ, the reign of Christ, it might feel weird to focus on the story of Jesus' crucifixion, to sing a hymn that is more associated with Palm Sunday than Christ the King Sunday. Uh, but at the core, here in this moment, in this dump on the outskirts of town, a place called the Skull, where the stench of death hangs heavily in the air and the flies buzz around the bodies of, of dying criminals, where life seems lost, that's where we find Jesus. Because his throne has never been a temple and a large seat and all of those things, his throne has always been the cross. And that fundamental reality, that aspect of our Christian faith, and, and maybe also the inability for people to see it, it, keeps people from seeing who Jesus really is. It keeps us, at times, from seeing who Jesus really is. Well, let's put a pin in that, um, because uh, we're going to back up a little bit. Uh, four weeks of this sermon series, it's the end of the world as we know it. Um, we've been focusing on the difficulties of life. We've been focusing on difficult texts. It has not been sunshine and roses. And so I want to just give us a little bit of space for just a moment to make things a little bit more uplifting. Hence singing a silly version of It's the End of the World as We Know It. Uh, but not completely uplifting because like, we're focusing on the crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, and it's going to invite us to step into that muck just a little bit. But... Before we do that, let's focus on the story of Jesus that we know and we love. Um, because I think thinking about his story and what we hear, especially in this Gospel of Luke, will help us see the hope. It will help us experience the beauty in the midst of all of the pain and sorrow. So I'll save the birth narratives for next week because, you know, Advent is only a week away. Um, so let's, let's focus on the, the ministry of Jesus. Uh, Jesus' ministry begins in all of the Gospels in a beautiful scene. 
He goes and he gets baptized by John the Baptist. And as he is in the water or coming out of the water, depending on which you know, gospel you read, they change just a little bit. But as he's, he's experiencing this moment, a voice proclaims from the heavens, this is my beloved. Before Jesus has preached any sermon, before anyone gets healed, Before there is any proof of who he is, God says, this is my beloved. This is the one I love. This is the one in whom I am well pleased. But then immediately, that title, that identity is challenged because Jesus goes out into the wilderness. He goes and he's tempted by the tempter and he's offered power and status and all of these things. The the temptation repeatedly is, If you are the Son of God, the Beloved, prove it. Prove that you are who people say that you are. Prove that you are who God says you are. And that idea, that challenge, never really leaves throughout the Gospels. If it's not the tempter in the desert, it's the Pharisees and the religious rulers who constantly question Jesus' authority. Well, is he truly who God says he is? Well, prove you can forgive. Prove you're not just some mystical agent of evil that knows how to make people stand and walk. Prove to us you are who people say you are. And it's not the outsiders either. Insiders too. Luke 9, Jesus asked the disciples, who, who, do, who do you think I am? And Peter, in one of the great Peter moments, says, well, you're the Messiah, And Jesus says, yes, correct, gold star, you did it right. You've been paying attention, Peter. And then Jesus says, and this is what that means. The Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. To which Peter says, nuh-uh, that's not how it works. (laughs) That is not acceptable. That doesn't fit with what it means to be Messiah to me. Being the son of God means power. It means authority. It means control, right? Like, right? Well, and you have Judas. Judas sells Jesus out. Maybe because he doesn't believe, but also maybe because he's trying to kind of force Jesus' hand to get him to prove who he was, to start overthrowing power and all of those things. The, the texts never actually tell us There are many today who still resonate with Peter, with his protest, with the image of Jesus that Jesus presents. There are many who still resonate with James and John who want to sit in power next to Jesus, who want to sit on thrones with God. People who want someone, a a God who is as powerful, but they and Peter And maybe us miss the true power that's on display in this moment, and the power of the cross. In all of that, the demanding of proof, the missing of the power on display is exactly what happens in our text. Jesus has been tried. He has been sentenced to death by crucifixion because he stood against the powers of his day, He demanded change. He tried to embody the love of God's kingdom that breaks down walls and barriers and and creates equality and justice and all these things. He's he's tried to live out this message of of the good news of God. And because of that, now he finds himself nailed to a cross. And still, in this moment, the text says people stood by watching. The leaders scoffed at him. He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah, God's chosen one. Prove yourself. Prove to us you are who you say you are. And then they give Jesus sour wine and say, well, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Prove who you are. And then the criminal who hung beside him joined in the questioning. Are you not the Messiah? Everyone keeps saying all these things. Save yourself, and and me too, while, while you're at it, please. Now's the time. Now's your chance. Prove to us who you are by doing what we want you to do. And that's the implication. 
proved to us by doing these things as we see them. Expectations are a funny thing. We all set expectations of people and, and things based on our understanding and our desires. For instance, um, one of the things that I struggle with is my expect expectations of Charlie. Charlie is just as tall as his sister, who is eight. He is several pounds heavier than his sister, who is eight. I look at him and I see someone who is just a little bit smaller than someone who's eight which means that when I look at him, even though I know that they are not the same age, that Emerson is eight and Charlie is not, my expectations of Charlie mirror my expectations of Emerson more often than not. And there are some expectations that are okay, right? Because they're, you know, at least in our family, there is an expectation that you will be kind, you will be loving, you will be respectful. That's our mantra when we get in the car. What are, what are we gonna do today at school? We're gonna be kind, we're gonna be loving, we're gonna be respectful, those are the things. So some expectations are okay, but also Emerson and Charlie are not the same person. Charlie is not eight. Charlie's five, just barely five. He's the youngest kid in his entire kindergarten class and the largest by far. He has ADHD, he has sensory seeking things, he, he has to be in motion, he has to be putting all of his muscles and energy into something to feel it. And so for me to expect him to act or think, or be like his sister is unfair. But the reality is, that's what I often do. Because I just, I look at him, and I see something, and I, I see this reality. It's hard to see the five-year-old kid who's still learning to be a human. Because he's six inches taller and 20 pounds heavier than everyone in his class. And I believe that's kind of the issue that we run into with Jesus. It's exactly the issue that's constantly addressed in the Gospels. This expectation of who the Messiah is or who the Messiah should be. Someone of power who brings control and retribu retrib retribution. There we go. You know, again, this, this is your, your weekly reminder. Like That's the, fundamentally the abhorrent belief in Christian nationalism this expectation that with belief in Jesus comes power, that if we believe in Jesus, we are somehow more powerful than others, that the kingship of Jesus and the kingdom of God is about control and dominion over. When people shout in the streets on Palm Sunday as we sing, they wanted a ruler who would come in military power and physically save them. James and John wanted to sit in power Peter refuses to believe the task of Jesus is to give his life. And we sometimes think that our belief in Jesus makes us more privileged or sets us above others. We have expectations of Jesus. But let's look at Jesus' own words in Luke 4 and see how he defines himself and describes himself. He, he walks into the temple, and he opens a scroll, the scroll of Isaiah, and it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That is who Jesus says he is. He sets that expectation for us. We cry out, prove who you are, and Jesus says over and over, well, this is who I am. I'm the one who proclaims the kingdom of God, where those at the bottom of society will find liberation from the systems and the structures that bind them. I am the one who brings freedom to captives. I am the one who seeks healing and wholeness and reconciliation for the people in this world that I love. And if that is who Jesus proclaims he is, if that is the expectation he sets, to find ourselves here looking at him nailed on a cross uh, is quite fitting again, because we're exactly where we belong, even as we proclaim Christ as king. Because here, in this place of death and pain, where everyone is around scoffing and shouting, prove yourself, show us what you've got, show us what you can do, show us your power, what does Jesus do? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It's 
kind of the only words he speaks. As the crowds shout their taunts, he whispers forgiveness. As the breath is choked out of his lungs, he promises paradise to the broken soul next to him. Freedom for the captive. None of this is the proof that anyone in the Gospels has looked for. It's not often the proof that we look for. This isn't the moment that we long for. This isn't the king that we sought. It's not the one we we dream in our minds. But this moment, this, this very moment, is the moment of the coronation of Jesus. This is Christ the king who walks straight into the middle of our misguided expectations. Christ the king who is willing to enter into the darkest parts of our reality and bring light and life. And he does it not by lording over people, but in this darkest of moments, he offers his life for the sake of those who don't know what they're doing. You know, I've quoted that verse many times in my life and in my ministry. Uh, You know, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And I, I don't know if I've ever really thought about how it fits into this moment. I thought about the importance of those words, but how it fits into this scene when Jesus is at the end of his life, when all is kind of falling apart around him, when everyone is demanding something of him, demanding of his life from him, he offers grace. He doesn't criticize. He doesn't critique. He doesn't ask them to repent. He's not like, hey, y'all, say you're sorry, I'll offer forgiveness, and then we'll be good. He doesn't argue. He doesn't point out their faulty logic. He just says, forgive them. Forgive us when we have no idea what we're doing. When we get so caught up in our systems, in systems that bind and oppress others, systems that we justify in the name of God at the expense of God's beloved. Even in those moments, Jesus looks out to us and says, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When our attention and affection gets so focused on our success and survival that we turn to all of these other voices, other forms of comfort and protection, when we listen to those who who mislead us and deceive us for our own sake, Jesus says, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When our hopelessness drives us to participate in in power struggles, seeking a sense of control in a world so much seeming out of our control, Jesus looks at us and says, forgive them. When we cry out in our despair and demand that Jesus prove himself according to our standards, he stands with his arms wide open, full of compassion and love. It reminds us that the only voice, the only power, the only source of hope we need is him. The king of kings, the lord of lords. The one who has given his life so that we might be called beloved. It's a dark moment. It's not pretty doesn't feel like that's how the short story should end for us in this liturgical season, but it's the place that we see the beauty of God, the beauty of God's beloved proving to us who he is, the one who loves us in spite of ourselves. May we have the strength to remember it wherever we go, wherever we are, that God loves us and there's nothing we can do to change that. Let's pray. Holy God, we give you all thanks and praise that you love us, that you offer us forgiveness, that you constantly show us your grace and your mercy and your love. Even when we don't get it, even when we are looking for and longing for something so different than who you've said you are, Help us to have eyes to see. That we can look in this darkest of moments. We can, we can see the pain and the sorrow, but also in that see the beauty that you are there for us. You are there because you love us. And that in our darkest moments, you will always be there 
to love, to support, and to encourage us. We give you all thanks and praise for these things, and we pray this in the wonderful, in the beautiful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's now stand and sing our responsive hymn, which I believe, I forget what it is, I'm sorry. 306, Fairest Lord Jesus, that's the one. may be seated. Uh, I've got a lot of things for us in the life of the church. I have, I have a whole like a whole list of stuff this month. So, uh, so hold on tight. Um, first, our way of the week is to open doors for others to lead. Um, our reformed tradition says that we are a priesthood of all believers. That we all have a job to play. That we all have a, a way that we are called to participate in God's mission. And so we try to do that. We try to. It, it, bring out the gifts that others have to celebrate those things, to create ways that others can step into um, opportunities to share their gifts for the glory of God. Um, so I encourage you to look for those in others and also name the gifts that you have at times. Um, be willing to jump into something even if you're like, well, not me. Well, yes, you. You too can serve Jesus. Um, so that's that. Uh, things for us in the life of our church. First, uh, immediately after worship, we're hanging the greens, y'all. Um, no one's excited. Come on. <laughs> We're going to get festive up in here. Um, so you can hang out after worship to help us do that. It will be wonderful. Um, in that same regard, Advent starts next week. I would love some worship leaders. If you want to participate in the season of Advent, there's a sheet out there in the back. You can sign your name. One week, two weeks, four weeks. Who cares? Just sign up and help me so that you all don't have to just listen to me. I know you'll be grateful, right? Um, this is one of those moments. If you have a neighbor who's like, you know how to read and talk, you can sign up to be a worship leader. That's one of those gifts. Um, there you go. Uh, there are no, um, there's no Bible study this coming Tuesday uh, or the month of December in general. We finished our study of the book of Revelation, and we're taking a break uh, through Advent because there's a whole lot of stuff going on, and y'all get busy too. Uh, so we'll start Bible study up again in January, and we're going to be looking at women of the Bible. Um, all of them that, you know, get overlooked and are kind of awesome. Uh, there's some, there's some, I don't know, better ways. There's a bad girls of the Bible who like Dinah, you know, jail. There's, there's some awesome, there's some awesome ones. Uh, so we'll, we'll go through some of those. Um, this coming week, the offices in the church are going to be closed because kids don't have school. There's a little bit of traveling happening back and forth. Um, so we won't physically be here. We'll be working remotely from wherever we find ourselves. But you can call uh, me or Amber. Or you can email us, and we'll, we'll be sure to get back with you. 
Um, that said, on Thursday, though, we will be having a um, Thanksgiving meal at 1230 here at the church for those that would like to uh, be present, those that you know, might not have family in the area or things of that nature. Um, it'll be at 1230 here at the church in the fellowship hall. You don't have to bring anything. The only thing uh, that we ask is that you contact Amber to let her know you're coming potentially. If you forget, that's fine, too. Uh, this isn't like a hard S RSVP, but that will help her make sure she has enough food prepared. Uh, but that'll be Thursday at 1230. Uh, you may have noticed in the back we have angels up for our angel tree, uh, which are uh, kids at our, the Lindsay House, which is a ministry we support. Um, they're hanging on the board. They need to be back, unwrapped by December 8th. Um, so get them now while the getting's good. And then on December 8th, we need them back so that we can um, deliver them. Uh, also on December 8th, we have a community choir coming. December 8th or 6th? 8th. Uh, uh, community choir here at the church. Um, in your bulletin, it says the doors open at 2. They don't, so don't be here at 2. Uh, they start singing at 3. We got a little ahead of ourselves. We thought that was the case. That's not the case, so just cross that out. But it'll be here uh, at 3 o'clock. Come participate. We have a couple people singing, and Amanda's playing, and it should be wonderful. And we're glad that we can kind of offer that to the community. Now you have two inserts in your bulletin. I told you I got a lot. Um, one is the poinsettia, uh, or do, is it just poinsettia, or do you add do the, the I, poinsettia? Both? Okay, well, that order form is in there. If you would like to uh, get one in honor of someone you love, uh, or someone you don't love, too, uh, you could do that, too. Um, but uh, that's in there, and you can drop it in your bulletin. Also, there's an, uh, another insert in there, that is uh, entitled the Oklahoma Presbytery Task Force. Um, this is for your information. Um, the gist of it is uh, we are part of the Eastern Oklahoma Presbytery. Um, the state of Oklahoma is broken into three presbyteries. In order to be a presbytery in the PCUSA, you need so many churches in that area to be a presbytery. One of our presbyteries is one church short of being a presbytery. The other has reduced. And as we're looking at kind of ministry in the state of Oklahoma, we've decided things need to change. Um, and so there's a task force looking at how we can combine to become a new presbytery. And so that's some of the work. Uh, at the last presbytery meeting, we were asked to share that uh, flyer with our congregations. Um, so you can think about it, ask questions if you have questions, participate in some of the larger presbytery things that are happening. There's a Bible study that's going to be happening in January via Zoom that you can participate in. Um, and if you have questions, you can come and talk to me. <sighs> Four more, I think. Um, next Sunday, we have Communion Sunday. And for the beginning of Communion, uh, we're calling all of our shepherds to bring socks. Uh, so if you want to donate socks for Sand Springs Community Services, you can bring them to worship with you next Sunday. All sizes are wonderful. Um, and in conjunction with that... On that Wednesday, December 4th, Nathan Woodmansey, who is the director of Sand Springs Community Services, is coming to our church for our first and third Wednesdays to share about some of the ministry that Sand Springs Community Services does, um, how our efforts to help might help up uplift them, and maybe some more ways that we can continue partnering. Um, but you can join us here for that. It'll be at uh, December 4th at 6.30. Um, we'll have some snacks and stuff like that and good conversation. Two Sundays after that, December 18th, we're having a white elephant gift exchange. Um, Y'all know what that is? I don't have to explain it. Um, that'll be fun on the 18th, again, 6.30. On the 19th, the day after that, on a Thursday, we're having our, our um, blue Christmas service uh, for those that kind of find the season of Advent and Christmas to be a little bit uh, difficult because uh, of loss or experiences or whatever that might be, but that'll be a service of encouragement and uplifting and things of that nature. Sunday, we have our Christmas breakfast, and then that Wednesday, we have Christmas Eve, and then Thursday is Christmas. I think that's all. Um, if you have questions, you can contact the church and let us know. You can read your Monday emails. You can take your bulletin with you that has lots of notes, but there's a lot happening this month, and I would love to see you there for any or all of it. Do I have anyone who's going to throw something at me to say I forgot something? Next month? What? Oh, this, oh, yeah, sorry. It, um, yeah, it's technically it's next month. We have a whole week of, thing of, of November left. It all starts next month. But, um, all right. I got it all. Go read your bulletin. Read your emails. All that stuff. Take notes. Whatever you need to do. Put it in your calendar. And we'll see you there. 
And now that I've gotten like my 90 things, uh, let's continue worshiping, um, as Marty said, by living lives of gratitude that are rooted in gratitude um, by giving of our tithes and our offerings. Holy God, we give you all thanks and praise for the ways in which you have reached down into this world to bless us, whether that is our, our time, our talents, our treasures, whatever it is that we have, we recognize that every good gift comes from you. And so we ask that you take our tithes and our offerings, which are just a, a way that we show our gratitude for all that you have done and that you use them for your glory, that you use them so that others come to experience your love and your grace and your mercy. And we pray this all in the wonderful and the beautiful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Uh, now let's join in our closing hymn, number 171, The King of Love, My Shepherd Is.
Um, one of the things that I think is interesting about that, the, that hymn and the psalm that's based on it is uh, if you pay close attention, it's a psalm we all love and know, uh, we all know it in the King James Version, um, but we, we love and know it, uh, but I don't know if we ever pay attention to the reality that we don't do anything in it. It's God who leads us, God who feeds us, God who sets a table, God who does all of the things. We just get carried around in God's love. Um, and I kind of love that, um, especially in moments as we've been focusing on this month where it can feel hopeless, where we look out in this world and nothing seems to be going right, when we look at our lives and we wonder where God is, when we have all of these questions and doubts which are, are totally okay and acceptable. But part of the reminder of that, that hymn, why we sang, is because at the end, part of the promise is that God is there with us that God is the one who will sustain us, that God is the one who will pick us up and carry us on God's shoulders and bring us to food and take care of us and all of those things, that in the darkest of moments, God is present because that is exactly where God dwells. That as the Psalms tell us, there is nowhere we can escape. Even into the depths of Sheol, God is there. And so wherever you might be, in those dark moments, in those moments where you have all of the questions and concerns, know that God is with you. Because God loves you, God cares for you, you are God's beloved, and there is nothing you can do, have done, or will do that will change that reality. And as you go into this world, as you end this liturgical year, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine down upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look deeply in your eyes and grant you peace. And may that peace which surpasses all of our understanding guard your heart, your soul, and your mind this day and forevermore. Amen? Go in peace unless you're going to hang the greens. Thank you.